your notes back if you want to get there. Okay, so first thing is we got to talk about what we thought was true for a very long time and now what we think is true now. Okay, and I say what we think because we never really know, right? There's always something that can come up that can maybe prove us wrong, okay? Because people back in the day knew that everything orbited the Earth, okay? And they were found to be wrong, okay? People thought the Earth was flat, and they're wrong. They knew the Earth was flat, and they're wrong. And there's still people who think that, and they're still wrong. Okay? But maybe I'll get proven wrong, and then I'll have to eat my shoe, right? Which I will gladly do, because that'll never happen, and I'll never have to eat my shoe, because the world is not flat. Okay? So we got to talk about what people thought was true in terms of the movement of bodies around other bodies. So for a very long time, everyone thought the Earth was the center of the universe. Kind of an arrogant idea, but that's what they thought. Okay? And there was actually good reason for them to think that. It looked from the ground, from here, like everything did go around the Earth. We watched the sun rise and set every day. We watched the moon rise and set every day. We watched the stars wheel overhead. It makes it look like everything is orbiting the Earth. It was a logical conclusion. Okay? I'm not saying these people were stupid. They made really good observations of things that moved in the heavens, and it made sense that they all orbited the Earth. Okay? The problem is we started observing some things that didn't agree with that idea. Okay? And notably, that would be other planets in our solar system. Even back as far back as the Greeks, okay? They knew that there were some stars that didn't behave like the others. They called them planets. What is the Greek meaning for the word planet? Anybody know? It means wanderer. Because these stars wandered. They didn't do what the other stars did. Okay? So they called them wanderers. They named them after gods because they figured, well, that must be because they don't do what the other stars do, so that's what we'll call them. And again, it made sense. They had no other reason or no other idea for why they would do what they did. And, but we've now learned since then that the reason these stars appear to wander is because they don't orbit the Earth. And so, way back when this is first kind of starting to come to become clear, let's say, a guy named Tycho Brahe has spent his entire life tracking the movement of stars and planets in the heavens. Okay? Like the guy sleeps during the day and is awake at night, and this is when he does all of his work. And I mean a lifetime's worth of work, volumes and volumes of books, tracking the movement of objects in the heavens, trying to prove mathematically that everything orbits Earth. Okay? And he has copious volumes of data it. Except some of those volumes contain data that doesn't say that. Or at least that he can't make say that. So unfortunately, even though he had great data and spent his whole life getting it all, he didn't do good science. Which was collect data, analyze the data, and come up with a conclusion for what the data says. He did it backwards. He had a conclusion, and he tried to force the data into the conclusion. In the same way, a small child might pound a puzzle piece into a spot that it doesn't fit in. Okay, Like it was that kind of logic. Right? So Tycho Brahe spends all this time, and he finally just says, I must just not be good enough at math to make this work. So he goes out, and he hires like the best mathematician around, Johannes Kepler. Gives Kepler his life's work. And he says, you're good at math. Make this say that everything orbits the Earth. Kepler's like, well, I need a job. So I'm going to go through all of this data. It only takes him a very short period of time to realize that Tycho Brahe's data is incredible, meticulous, awesome. But it doesn't say what he wants it to say. And there's no way he can make it do that because he's good at math and the math doesn't say that everything orbits the Earth. So he's in a bit of a pickle. He wants a job. He likes getting a paycheck. 
He doesn't want to upset his boss, whom he has to tell is wrong, and his entire life's work is wasted. He knows Bray is not going to like this. Bray is not a very nice guy, by the way. And he had a very scandalous life. And, um, and so he knows that if he tells Bray that he's wrong, he's going to flip out. Well, he can only stall for so long. Bray wants an answer. So he comes to him and he says, all right, enough. Enough's enough. You're supposed to be good at math. You should have this problem done by now. And Kepler's like, uh, had it done for quite a while. I just needed a paycheck. You're wrong. Your data clearly says that the Earth is not the center of the universe. In fact, only one thing that you have tracked actually orbits the Earth, and it's the Moon. Everything else orbits the Sun, and the Sun orbits something else, and I don't know what it is. And Bray loses his ever-loving you-know-what. Yeah, he fires them on the spot, and they go into a Montague and Capulet blood feud for the rest of their days. Tycho Bray goes to his grave believing that everything orbits the Earth. Okay? Even though, right before his death, Kepler presented his findings using Bray's data to the world to prove the Copernican idea that everything, that everything in our solar system orbits the sun. So imagine your life's work being used to humiliate you. That's what happened to Bray. Okay. So you can understand, they didn't get along much after that. So the source of this problem was that Tycho Bray observed the planets, and he found that they didn't always move in a nice circle. OK, so Mars was really the planet that gave him the most trouble. Because as he observed Mars, Mars would move through the sky like it orbits the Earth. But at various points in the sky, Mars would do this. There would be a short period of time where Mars would appear to back up, where it would just stop and then go the other way in the sky and then start to go back the other way again. Now, why would something orbiting the Earth stop, go backwards, and then turn around and go back again. It made no sense. Okay? And it certainly wasn't explained by any of the, the, there were some wacky models out there to explain some of these movements okay, for everything orbiting the Earth, like really, really wacky stuff. Okay? Almost like Earth, flat Earth stuff, almost like that wacky. Okay? So that couldn't be explained until Kepler came along and he said, I know exactly why that's happening. It's because they both orbit the sun, and this is when Earth passes Mars because Earth is inside of Mars, and so it orbits faster. Okay? Imagine this. You're on the highway, and you're passing somebody. As you're passing that car, which way does it look like that car is going? It makes it look like it's going backwards. You know it's going forwards, but from your perspective relative to you, it is moving backwards. Okay? So this happens as Earth passes Mars in its orbit. Okay? Makes it look like Mars is going backwards. It's not. just looks that way relative to the motion of the Earth. And the only way that can happen is if they're both orbiting the same center, the Sun. Okay? All the planets do this. Okay? The inner ones look a little bit different, but they, they essentially have a similar pattern to their movement. Okay, so Kepler uses Tycho Bray's data and he comes up with this idea. First thing is, he noticed, because Bray's data was so incredible, that there were points in the orbits of all the planets where they appeared to move faster than at other points in their orbit. Okay? And the only reason they would appear to move faster would be if they actually were moving faster. Okay? So he knew that when you whirled something in a circle, that the, the speed was constant. But if you change the radius, the speed would change. So he theorized that the orbits of these planets were in perfect circles, that they were slightly ellipsoid. And that would mean that at some points their radius was less, and at some points their radius was more, so there were points in their orbit where they moved faster. 100% okay? true. Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. Okay? There are points in our orbit where we move faster than others. Okay? So Kepler came up with his first law, and his first law is the law of elliptical orbits. Okay? The planets move in orbits that are slightly elliptical. Okay? Now, this is greatly exaggerated, 
okay? Earth's orbit does not look like this. If it did, we would sequentially fry and then freeze, okay? Because this is a huge difference, right? We are talking, um, you know, well, nothing that looks like this. It would be just slightly off, almost imperceptible of a perfect circle, okay? That's just how slightly ellipsoid the orbit is. All right, so Kepler comes up with that. Okay. Now, as the Earth goes around the sun, like so, okay, it gets slightly closer to the sun and speeds up. Now, at what point in our orbit do you suppose we're moving the fastest or that we're closest? What season? That's what everybody thinks because logically, right? I'm closer to the sun and so it should be warmer. It's actually not. <coughs> we're actually closer in the wintertime. Okay. Ever notice? that all the months aren't the same length. This used to bother me. You like, you never figure out, like, why do I have to remember which ones I still don't? Remember which ones are 30 and 31. Now, I remember February, it's always got 28, that's easy. Okay, but some of the months are, are shorter than others. Okay, the reason for that is, that's what makes the calendar work. Winter is our shortest season in the Northern Hemisphere because that's when Earth is closest to the sun. Okay, so, when we are here, in our orbit, okay, we face away from the sun. Okay, the North Pole faces away from the sun, so this is winter. Okay, so this would be like December 31st. Okay, everybody with me on that? Sorry, 21st. 21st. Oh man, this is a rough one. I'll just start over. Okay, December 21st, winter solstice. Okay, this point and this point are right, they're the equinoxes. Okay, so that would be March 21st and September 21st. Okay, and this is coming up. Summer solstice, June 21st. Now, this orbit is shifted slightly. So it's like this squished and pulled this way just slightly. Okay, so that Earth is actually closest here, and that's why our summer months are shorter, or sorry, are longer than our winter months, okay? Winter, as a season, has 89 days. Autumn has 90 days. Spring and summer are 93 and 94 days, okay? Because Earth's orbit's not quite a perfect circle, okay? Strange but true. Never thought of it, right, before, okay? And it took me, it wasn't like until about well, let's say 20 years ago that I learned this, okay? When I first started teaching physics, I was like, oh, now it all makes sense. Now I don't care to remember which months are shorter because I know this, okay? So, Kepler's first law, law of elliptical orbits, okay? His second law is the law of equal areas, which talks about what the orbits actually look like, okay? So, this is the mathematical proof for Kepler's law of elliptical orbits the law of equal areas. So this period of time here is the same amount of time as this is. These areas are equal, but the distance around the orbit is greater. Okay, and if we go a greater distance around the sun during that time because we're closer to it, we're moving faster, okay? So this is winter, this is summer, okay? So in our summer months, okay, we go on a slightly shorter part of the orbit, okay, because we're further away and going slower. Everyone okay with that? Now, there is something called um, precession, and that is that because Earth's orbit isn't perfect, we actually start to have this change, okay, and that in a few thousand years, it'll be summer at Christmas. I'll show you a video about it. It's hard for me to explain the, the guy in the video I have explained it perfectly. All right, so here's the eccentricity of the various planets' orbits in our solar system. So this is how far off of a perfect circle is their orbit. Mercury, 20%. Okay, so at its closest point, which is called perigee, it is 20% closer to the sun than at apogee, which is its furthest point. That's considerable. That's quite elliptical. Okay, Venus is almost perfect. Okay? It's less than 1% different between apogee and perigee. 
Okay? Earth, just under 2%, which is why we have that fairly significant difference, right? 89 to 94 days for a length of a, of a quarter of a year. Okay? Um, Mars, quite a bit more than that, almost 10%, 9.3% off. So when it's at its closest point, it's 9.3% closer okay, than it is at Apogee. Right, uh, Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, about 8%. Jupiter, just under 5%. Saturn, just over 5%. Uranus, just under 5%. Neptune, almost a perfect circle. Okay. Pluto, 25%. Okay. This is part of the reason Pluto is no longer part of the planet club. Okay. You guys probably don't remember this. I don't even know if you were born when that decision was made, okay? but you would have been very young if you were. Um, they decided Pluto's no longer kicked it out of the Planet Club okay? because it didn't fit what they defined as the, the um, defining characteristics of a planet. It must dominate its orbit, okay? which means it must be the biggest thing in its orbit. Okay? And secondly, it must orbit in the plane of the ecliptic. Okay, which means it could eclipse other planets because it orbits around. So when you have the sun, okay, the eight planets all orbit in the ecliptic plane so they can eclipse each other. Everyone with me on that? Pluto does this. It's outside the ecliptic. And its orbit is so elliptical that at some points it's closer to the sun than Neptune. This isn't always the furthest planet. Okay. So it does not dominate its orbit because it's crossing Neptune's orbit at some point. At some point, that's going to end badly. Okay? It's like going through an intersection without stopping. Eventually, there's going to be another car coming when you do that. Okay? So um, it's quite, it, quite eclip or elliptical. Eris, okay, which is the, actually the goddess of discord, this is the one that was when it was discovered, was the reason Pluto got kicked out of the planet. Okay, it was another Kuiper Belt object similar to Pluto. Okay, Cydna is another one. Okay, it's actually a long period like comet. Okay, and so comet orbits look like this. They go way, way out into like the Oort cloud. Then they come really, really close to the sun, and then they go way back out into the Oort cloud again. Okay, so that would be ninety percent off of a perfect circle. Okay, it gets way closer to the sun at its closest point than at its furthest. All right. So if we're looking at yeah, if we're looking at the Earth and its speed as it goes around the Sun, okay, during the winter when we're actually closest to the Sun, okay, we are moving at 109,289 kilometers an hour. We're ripping through space. That's fast. Okay, but at apogee, where we're further away, it's almost 4,000. Actually, yeah, almost 4,000 kilometers an hour different. Okay, it's significant. Right? And so we see that that's obviously going to mean we don't get as far around the sun in our orbit, which is why summer and spring are longer than winter and fall. Okay? Everybody all right with that idea? Okay, that's what we think is true right now. We have lots of evidence to support that because we have good observations okay, of all of the planets and <coughs> things like that. All right. So Kepler's third law is the mathematical death blow to Bray. Okay? He's got the law of elliptical orbits. He's got the law of equal areas. He's like, everyone's like, oh, okay, that makes, that makes really good sense. You know, we like that idea. You know, it explains a few things. And then this is what, this is what Kepler discovered with Bray's data. Bray had measured how long it took all of the planets to complete an orbit. And from that, he had calculated what their orbital radii were. Not so much their orbital radii. He had calculated how far he thought they were from the sun, okay? which in his mind was not their orbital radii, okay? but he had done it. And what Kepler found using Bray's data was if you put any two planets in our solar system into this equation, their numbers always equaled each other. Okay? So if I put the period of Earth's orbit cubed, or squared and divided it by the radius of Earth's orbit cubed, I get k which Kepler, as a stick to Bray, called Kepler's constant. All right? Then I plug in Jupiter's data. I get exactly the same number. Saturn's data, exactly the same number. All right? 
That proves mathematically they have the same orbital center, the sun. Okay? If that wasn't true, then there'd be proof for all of the other planets having the same Kepler constant because they orbited the Earth. Okay? So even if you like, put something like Pluto in there, would it yep. still be cool? So that's another yeah. reason why they were confused if it wasn't? Exactly. Yeah, anything that orbits the sun, okay, even long period comets, this holds true. Okay? If we do this for the moon, and any satellite orbiting the Earth, we'll get the same number. We'll get the Kepler constant for Earth orbiting objects. Okay? So if you do this for Mars, whose two moons are Phobos and Deimos, they have the same Kepler constant. They both orbit Mars. Okay. Everybody with me there? Yeah? All right, so this was like, what do you do if you're brave at this point? It's your data, okay? and it doesn't say what you want. In fact, it says the exact opposite, and it's proven mathematically. So it was kind of a big deal. Okay? Now, this formula we used to use, we actually used to do problem solving with it in, in Physics 20, but it's limited in its application. It'll only work if the two things you're looking at orbit the same body, and if you have just the right information about both of them. Okay? So we very rarely ever use it. For orbits and satellites, which is anything that orbits something else, we typically solve those problems by saying this. Gravity is acting as a centripetal force and causing that object to orbit the other. Okay? That's what we're going to get into tomorrow. Okay? Is gravitation as, I'm sorry, not tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. Gravity as a centripetal force. All right, so what we need to get out of all of this are these things in yellow. You need to add them to your notes. They're not in there. This is a perfect multiple choice question type of thing. Okay? Kepler's three laws. So I could very easily make a multiple choice question that says, which of the following would Kepler not agree with? Because he has three, and a multiple choice question has four. All right, so first one, the law of elliptical orbits. Planets in the solar system have elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. Okay, number two, a line drawn from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Law of equal areas. Okay? And the ratio of a planet's orbital period squared to its orbital radius cubed is constant. Okay? All or objects orbiting the same central focus will have the same constant. That's the law of periods. Okay? So just quickly copy those down and add them to your notes okay? so that you have them. It's not something that you're going to have to write out yourself, like regurgitate, but be able to recognize it. Okay, so just to kind of add a bit of perspective to this, all of these calculations, all of these conclusions that Kepler was able to draw about objects orbiting the sun versus the earth was done with no knowledge of the force of gravity. Okay, this predates Newton. Okay. So, they, he didn't have an un he understood how things could move in a circle, okay? but there was no understanding that gravity was this force that could act over distances and things like that. Okay? So he did this without understanding that the sun is more massive than anything else in the solar system. In fact, everything else in the solar system combined does not have a mass equal to the sun. Okay? In fact, it's still just a fraction of the sun's mass, all right? meaning the sun is the source of the gravity that holds everything in our solar system together. Right? Um, so he did this without an understanding of that. Okay, which makes it even more amazing that he was able to determine all of these, these things happen. And also a credit to Bray in the quality and detail of his observations. Okay. Now, Kepler's uh, law of periods here relied on him you know, knowing a few things like how far Earth was from the sun, okay, and knowing that the Earth's orbital period is 31,556,736 seconds. Okay. So if you ever need some piece of useless trivia, there it is. That's the Earth's orbital period in seconds. Okay? It comes up to roughly 365 and one quarter days. Okay. Yep. Um, you'd think Bray would have gotten insane trying to... He kind of did. Like I say, over and over and over yeah. he had a very scandalous life. I think it's how he dealt with his problems. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't a terribly nice person. From all right. Um, so... That's kind of just the background for, for Kepler and for Bray, okay? and just knowing Kepler's laws because they dictate what we understand about planetary movement. Okay, now, the next thing we want to talk about are astronomical units. Sometimes this comes up, it's not something we're likely to use, okay? but an astronomical unit is the distance from the center of the Earth 
to the center of the sun. Okay? It is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. That is one astronomical unit. We sometimes use those with Kepler's law of periods when we're doing calculations because then we don't have to use giant numbers like 1.50 times 10 to the minus 11. All right, we can use things like an astronomical unit and we can use time intervals like years instead of seconds. All right, when we're setting forces equal to each other, we have to use meters and seconds as our units for time and for, for distance. Okay. All right. Now. Um, we're going to skip that because that's his law of periods, which we're not using anymore. Okay, so just to give you an idea here, okay, these are all the different um, numbers for Earth now, or for our solar system. You have the ones that we want you to use on the back of your formula sheet under other useful constants because the ones from the book are slightly different. Okay, uh, on your sheet, Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24, and its radius is 6.37 times 10 to the 6. We want you to use the numbers on your sheet, not these numbers. These are just to give you kind of comparative um, distances. Okay, um, So to give you an idea here of the mass, there's the mass of the sun. 1.99 times 10 to the 30. Okay, The next biggest thing in the solar system is more than a thousand times smaller than that. Okay, And that's Jupiter. You could add all these numbers together and you're not getting 1.99 times 10 to the 30. It is, the sun is absolutely massive. Is that in kilograms? That is in kilograms, yep. Okay. All right, and to give you an idea of some of the distances that we're talking about, okay, Mercury is just under three times closer okay, to the sun than we are. Venus is about three quarters of the distance to the sun that we are. Mars is one and a half times further from the sun. Okay, uh, Jupiter is five times further. Um, Saturn is nine and a half times. Uranus, by the way, that's how you say it. It is not Uranus. That's something else. Okay, Uranus is the planet. Uranus is something else. Okay, um, and Neptune, okay, is thirty times further away from the sun than we are. Pluto, on average, is thirty-nine times, but can be inside of, of uh, Neptune sometimes. Okay, and then um, Cydna and Eris, okay, those are their averages. Okay, uh, obviously Cydna can be a lot closer um, when it's at its closest point. Right, so it just gives you some idea there. Okay, and Mars has two moons, Deimos and Phobos. Why do we call them that? I'm just gonna say why do they call Eris mass, we probably do now, but at the time this book was published, it was a pretty recent discovery. Yeah. Um, okay, why do we call them Phobos and Deimos? I know, sorry. Oh. Okay, what's your other question? If you were to scale down the size of Earth and the sun, like in the, um, so say the sun was like a beach ball or something, how mm -hmm. far away would Earth be? There's actually a guy, I'll have to find the video on YouTube, there's a guy that did it, and he did it out in the desert. Yes. And it was like kilometers of driving to get to the different planets, and they were all scaled. So the sun was, I can't remember how big it was, but the Earth was like a tiny marble. Jupiter was like a baseball, maybe. Like, it, yeah, he had all these different things. It was perfectly scaled. I'll find it, and okay. we'll, we'll watch it at some point. Um, OK, Phobos and Deimos, what do they mean? Panic and fear. Panic and fear, the companions of war. Mars is the god of war. His companions are fear and panic. There is actually a naming system in place for any body in our solar system. You have to name it a certain way. You don't get to pick the name. The guy that discovered Eris, he wanted to call it Xena, the warrior princess. That's what he wanted to call it. Okay? The, the uh, Planetary Scientist Union or whatever it was called wouldn't let him do it. Okay? They're like, no, you can't name it that. You have to name it something else. It has to be named after a, a god in Greek or Roman mythology. So Eris was the god of discord, which it caused, because that's what got Pluto kicked out of the planet club. So yeah, it was an appropriate name, and better than Xena, the warrior princess. Okay. I kid you not, like, he really did want to do that. Um, all right, so there's actually a naming system in place. So if you look at the names of all the planets in the solar system and their um, 
and there are moons, there's a system in place. For Earth, it's easy. We only have one moon. So you know what to call it, the moon. Okay? But its actual name is Luna. Okay? Um, so we have Terra, Earth, Luna. Okay? Mars <coughs> has Phobos and Deimos. Okay? Anything else, if anything else is discovered orbiting Mars, it will have to be, have a war theme of some kind. Jupiter, this one's awful. Jupiter has a lot of moons, like over 60, something like that, at current knowledge. They are all named for the lovers of Zeus. And we're not out of names, okay? Zeus was not very nice. Kind of a don't hate the player, hate the game kind of guy. Okay, yeah, um, totally like that. Um, so yeah, they're all for the lovers of Zeus, okay? Um, for Saturn, okay, um, they are all to do with um, like time and uh, the Titans. They're all named for Titans. Okay. As of February 2023, Jupiter has at least 92 known moons. Yeah, I just found one that says 80 and 95. I'm somehow even more grossed out now. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. And so for Saturn, they're all named after like the, the the Titans. For Uranus, remember that that's how it's pronounced. Okay. They are all Shakespearean characters. What? <laughs> Uh, there's not one that's Macbeth, but there's like uh, um, Puck and um, Oberon and like all the, yeah, but, yeah there's all, all Shakespearean characters. For Neptune, it all has a nautical theme, okay? The, the biggest moon is Triton, named for the trident that, they, that Neptune carried. And for Pluto, they're all uh, underworld related, because Pluto's the god of the underworld, so its biggest moon, Charon, is the boatman that takes you across the river Styx. Okay? The guy you have to pay the coins to. It's why they would put coins on people's eyes when they when they died. It was so that they could pay the ferryman to take them across the river Styx, the ferryman of Terra. So there's all these rules for naming the moons in the solar system. Let's say we did ever live on Mars, would you be able to see both those yep. moons? Yeah. In fact the rovers have got pictures of them. Really? Yeah. Now here's the weird thing about them. They're both, they're not like moons like ours. They're not circular. They're captured asteroids. Um, one of them is falling in and the other is flying off. I can't remember. I think it's Phobos that's falling in and Deimos that's flying off. So there's one that goes around several times a day and one that has a longer period. And but you can see them. Say if you lived in Jupiter, would you see a bunch of... If you could see through the, the atmosphere, yes. Um, but yeah, it's all... And where would you stand? We don't know really. Isn't it it's all gas, possibly a liquid core, maybe a, even a, there's theories out there that it could be a graphite or diamond core. Yeah, weird stuff. Was Zeus not a made-up person? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's a Greek god, so, I mean, it's mythology. Who came up with his character then? The Greeks? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know who, but like, anyone in particular. Yep. If more still have water, how much would like two moons affect the, uh, the tides there? Like, would it... um, I would have to think probably not hugely. There'd be some, obviously, but they're not big, yeah. right? Like our moon is really big for the planet that it orbits, okay? Um, like our moon for, I think it's, it's one of the highest, it is the highest ratio, I think actually of moon size to planet size, so that we're actually considered like a double planet system because the moon is really that big. It's not technically a planet anymore. It isn't Pluto and Charon technically. Yes, they're planet. also, yeah, because they're all very, very close to the same size as well. Is there any room, like, you can, like, physically just, like, walk around, start at one spot, and just, like, but, like, it's not. Well, I mean, technically, I mean, you could do that with our moon, but. Anyone, but like, uh, Phobos and Deimos, they're pretty small. You could, I mean, if they had enough gravity for you to effectively walk on them, yeah, you could do that, but they don't have very much gravity because they're not very big. All right, does that make it some sense? There you go, some really, really useless trivia out of today. And Phobos is 11 kilometers and Deimos is 6 kilometers across. Oh yeah, so they're very, very small. Yeah, they look like potatoes. When they catch them in the, in the like cameras of the rovers, they look like a potato flying through the sky. Okay, so, um, Oh yeah, here's the moons. See, we got them all here. Uh, these are only the four largest, seven most large, five most. Deep. So there we go. Miranda and um, Ariel and Umbriel, Titania, Oberon. Yeah. So 
And then Neptune, yeah, three, well, I cut it off there for some reason. But it gives you an idea. Okay, now the next thing we want to talk about here is a little bit to do with gravity, but also the guy named Cavendish that I was mentioning before. Okay. So Newton came up with his theory of gravity, the whole, actually it's full of crap story of getting hit in the head with an apple. Okay. Um, so his idea was that the force of gravity was a force of attraction between two objects not of one on another like we typically express it or think of it, okay? We always think that the Earth's gravity pulls everything towards the Earth. Well, it's actually not true. That's what we see, but in actual fact, everything is attracted to each other by gravity. The Earth is just as attracted to the apple as the apple is to the Earth, okay? It is a mutual attractive force between them. So this is what Newton thought. The force of gravity has to do with the two masses that are attracted to each other and their separation distance, or r. Okay? The, the, the distance between their centers. Okay? Problem was, he had lots of data to support this, but he couldn't make the numbers work because it was difficult to run an experiment on Earth. Because Earth would mess it up all the time. Why? Massive gravity. Yeah, we're in Earth's gravity field or gravity well. You can't run an experiment on gravity without Earth's gravity being involved. And it was very hard to remove it from any experiment that he was trying to run because, well, he was kind of stuck here. Okay. So it took another person later on to develop an experiment that actually just from a vector perspective, eliminated Earth's gravity from the equation. He set up a horizontal apparatus with various masses on what we call a torsion balance, okay? which basically means everything is suspended on a wire, and the tensile strength of that wire is known. When the, the objects start to move because of their gravitational attraction to each other, the wire will torque. And X amount of degrees takes X number of newtons of force. And then from there, he was actually able to measure the force of attraction between the objects without Earth's gravity getting in the way. Okay? It was a very ingenious experiment. I'll actually show you. I found two videos of people replicating the experiment okay? with like strings and rulers and like bowling balls and stuff like that okay? that actually works. And you can actually see in a time lapse the gravitational attraction between the objects. What? Yeah. All right, so this was Newton's idea, but it didn't work mathematically. Cavendish came along and got the value for G. And he's the one who was able to make it work. So we'll talk more about that one tomorrow, but I got a couple videos I want to show you here to do with the movement of Earth.